religion, gender, and colonialism are intricately interwoven, and neglecting this interconnection risks perpetuating the enduring effects of oppressive colonial rule experienced by women. Their collective work meticulously exposes the overlapping biases against religion, women, and non-Western perspectives within the realms of women's studies, religious studies, and post-colonial studies. With diverse cultural backgrounds, a multi-religious focus, and a range of theoretical approaches, their collection forms a rich tapestry that resists any attempt at a singular feminist post-colonial religious viewpoint. Despite this diversity, a common thread unites the essays. The question of whether the subaltern, particularly the subaltern woman within religious contexts, can find her voice. Drawing from Spivak's influential query, the authors collectively explore the historical agency and resistance displayed by subaltern women. Yet, they contend that Western feminist thinkers often fail to acknowledge this agency of phenomenon, Donaldson terms the refusal of subject status to the oppressed. She critiques the sanctioned ignorance within academic feminist discourse regarding Native American women, advocating for a decolonized reading of both indigenous and non-native sources, to unearth the partial testimonies of Native women's agency. Quark's essay hones in on Mary Daly's critique of Chinese foot-binding, revealing how Western feminist perspectives can sometimes paint a misleading picture of white women saving brown women from brown men. Quok counters this by demonstrating that patriarchy, even in its most oppressive forms, does not render its victims entirely voiceless and powerless. She provides historical examples of Chinese women actively resisting foot binding, including their collaboration with the Chinese Missionary Church, despite its patriarchal structure. Kwok's work challenges First World Feminism, exposing its tendency towards Orientalism, and its oversimplification of Third World women's experiences. Yejinoglu employs Foucault's insights to analyze the veiled body in Islam, revealing that Muslim women's bodies are similarly subject to the shaping forces of power, just as Western women's bodies are influenced by societal norms. She dismantles the Western feminist narrative that paints Eastern women as passive victims in need of liberation, emphasizing that both contexts involve complex power dynamics. Dube highlights the multifaceted expression of subaltern voices in the two-thirds world, particularly in Africa. She illustrates how African women have drawn on indigenous religio-cultural traditions, decimated by colonial Christianization, to empower themselves. Simultaneously, they have carved out spaces of resistance within the African Christian Church. Drawing on Patton's research, a parallel situation emerges for women Sanskritists in India, who have forged a nuanced hybrid space of post-colonial empowerment and spirituality, through their specialized study of elite texts. Miriam Cook and M. Sean Copeland illuminate a crucial theme. That religious feminism is far from an oxymoron. Cook scrutinizes the emergence of Islamic feminism, a movement deeply committed to both religious faith and pro-women activism. This development counters the prevailing bias in secular Western feminism, which often dismisses the possibility of advocating for women's rights within patriarchal religious frameworks. Muslim feminists who choose to adhere to traditional head coverings or attire in line with Islamic principles, are frequently labeled as victims of patriarchy by Western feminist perspectives. Nevertheless, 
They persist in asserting their right to navigate this complex and often conflicting space of belonging and resistance within Islam. Copeland bears witness to the potential of religious feminism in her essay, tracing the historical colonization of black women's bodies by various sectors of society, both white and black, including within the black church itself. Through a womanist theological lens, Copeland responds to the dual oppressions of sexism and racism stemming from slavery, as well as the misogynistic messages prevalent in rap music and the black film industry. Her response involves the reclamation of the black sermon as a decolonizing tool, aimed at reclaiming the black church as a sanctuary for African American women a space of empowerment, social change, and hope. Laura Levitt's examination of Judaism in Napoleonic France, effectively extends the arguments presented in the editor's introductory essay, underlining the imperative need to analyze the interconnected dynamics of gender, religion, and colonialism as a unified trilogy. This volume, with its multidisciplinary approach and global perspective, sets a high standard for future scholarship on this multifaceted subject matter. It particularly calls on Western white feminists to engage in greater self-reflection regarding their own biases.